while Albert uh, Momo from Trimble Chairs, our uh, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, DEI, and really has exerted tremendous leadership for that committee. Uh, on our WGIC, or the Secretariat staff, Ku Haley has been the point person on that. And for many of our committees, you'll know that a lot of times getting all the busy people from each of our industries together is like herding cats. So, Ku Haley, you've done a really nice job on that. Um, and really, the report was done under Albert's direction, and, and so I'll let him do most of the talking here. Mm -hmm. But but before I hand over the mic, it was really Albert, <coughs> who was Trimble executive, came to WGIC several years ago and said, listen, there is a general challenge in our community from a diversity perspective. Now, it can be uh, racial, ethnic, uh, gender, geographic diversity. There are many dimensions to that. You'll see those referenced in the report. But through uh, Albert's assertiveness, uh, presented to the board the need for a committee where, much like the last panel discussed from an ocean's perspective, if you were in that room, that in many ways we're stronger together than individually. And so I think there was a really nice tie-in from that last panel to what Elbert was able to do within WGIC to create a diversity, equity, and inclusion panel uh, committee um, and with a couple members and then to uh, not just get together to talk, but to have a product that comes out of that committee. So, Elbert, I'll get off the stage, <laughs> leave it to you to talk about the report, and then invite your panelists up. And I guess before we, let me just say before I give up the mic, another thing about what has been so good for WGIC here with the entire InterGeo team is that they have allowed us to present um, what we call our Trailblazer Awards. It was launched last year at Intergeo in Essen, and we're going to repeat that effort here in Berlin. So thanks to the entire Intergeo team. Albert, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, you know, before I start this, as you know, this is probably one of the last events of Barbara as the the, the, the lead person for WGIC. So let me take this opportunity, Barbara, to thank you for, for your leadership and for all you have done for WGIC and in particular for the DEI committee. We, we owe you a lot. We, your support was, uh, I would say, the most important element that uh, brought us to the success that we are having now. So thank you so much. And we hope to still be able to, to lean on, on you, you know, whenever we're going to need your advice or your leadership. And thank you again, Barbara. And I will echo Barbara also by thanking uh, Kuele for, she's really the, the brain behind this. She's, she's the one who, who did all the work. Yes, yeah, please, you. She, she really deserves uh, the, the, uh, all of this. I, you know, Barbara said, I think we are very successful in the DEI committee for all we were able to accomplish in the past, what, two, three years that we started this. So we start with a white paper on, on DEI in general, uh, and now I'm really, really proud to, to launch this book. Because there is, this, there is some, this report, I mean, there is something that we identify the minute we start talking about the uh, in the geospatial committee, is that when you look, when you go to events, or when you look at the leadership of geospatial companies, the lack of diversity is very clear, right? Everywhere you go, you don't see enough women, so there's a gender diversity that needs to be pointed out. There is a racial diversity also that needs to be pointed out. And most of the time, people will give you the, the, the easy answer. Oh, we cannot find them. That's why they are not here. We, we can, you know, we, we can create diversity because people are not interested. This report will tell you something different. And this report is based on studies on surveys, and there are actually more surveys coming, coming out 
but I, I want you really to look at this and say, the issue of leadership diversity within geospatial companies is something that is real, is something that can be addressed, and is something that we want to be part of the solution. So that's all I'm going to say. You can go and download this. Uh, I don't know if you have the, the code there. Can we show it at some point? But people should be able to, to download the report. And we also, you know, Kuela and I are still are already thinking about the, the next one, where we're going to have actually a little bit more information coming from the surveys that are, that are going out. And we plan to launch that one, you know, probably during Joe week. Uh, and we will have something else uh, for interview next year. So that will, that's the first part of this uh, DI event. And then the second part is one that I, I really enjoy because it, it gives me and you the opportunity to, to hear from some of the people that we have selected because of their knowledge of the DI issue and because of the need for us to continue having the conversation and to continue educating people on DEI uh, matters within geospatial community. So we set up this, um, this panel discussion where I'm going to have, unfortunately we lost one person, so we're going to have four bright minds from the geospatial community coming here and answer some of the questions that we have when it comes to DEI. And hopefully you're going to leave this event with more element to add to your toolbox on DEI. And more importantly, I always want people to leave this becoming more and more advocate for, for DEI. So let me invite here Laura Burns from Diversity Communications. Clinton Johnson from ESRI. Oh, Proja Maratar from Fugro. And last but not least, Olivia Powell from the UK Office of National Statistics. And this, maybe this, yeah. uh, I think we have to be closer. I will sit here, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so uh, this is not the first time we're doing this. Some of the people here I kind of tire of me bringing them to those events and asking them tough questions, but I'm still going to do that. So let me sit and give you a little bit of history behind this. This is, you know, within WGIC, I don't know, the fifth or the sixth one that we're having, where we just had people sitting, you know, in front of sometimes a larger audience than this but sitting in front of an audience and try to go deeper in the, the DEI issues within the geospatial community. So, I think the first one we had, Barbara, correct me if I'm wrong, was 2021 at Geospatial World Forum. And we found out that this is a very effective way to, to push for people to be aware, because at that time it was really awareness, right? Be aware of DEI issues, because some of the time people just don't know, you know, and you cannot, you cannot fix something that you don't know, and of course you cannot fix something that you cannot name. So that's why we move from awareness to actions, and we always wanted people to be able to hear from us without any filter how some of us, how people feel, you know, when it comes to, to diversity and how people live in the, the workplace, in the environment, uh, some of the diversity issues. So without any, any more talk from me, let me ask the first question to, to someone who I think is well equipped to give that answer. So I, I will talk to Clinton first. Uh, because I have this question, what is the current state of leadership diversity in the geospatial sector and why is it important to have diverse leaders 
in this field. Thank you for the question, Albert, and thanks for having me on this panel. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm honored to be here with such esteemed colleagues, both in the geospatial sector, but also focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, um, you know, before I answer the question, I always want to make sure that we're on the same page about the terms that we use, because I think sometimes people will hear these terms so much and not fully understand what they mean. So I want to talk about what diversity means. So when we talk about diversity, what we're really referring to is how well our teams and our organizations reflect the richness of the human tapestry, right? We want to understand the degree to which the unique, the broad, the expansive voices that, that make up the world are reflected in our organizations. And I think we all understand this to some degree, right? But I'm gonna use a bowl of fruit as an example. So imagine you have a bowl of oranges in the middle of the table. Would anyone refer to that bowl of oranges as a diverse bowl of fruit? They wouldn't. Even if you added one or two apples to this bowl of 10 oranges, you would know that that is not a diverse bowl of fruit. And while people are not fruit, likewise, you would know that if you looked at a leadership team that had five or six people on it and only one of them was a woman, you would know that that team was not diverse. Likewise, you would know that if you looked at a team of, let's say, 10 people and half of those people were women, but the women on that team shared the same racial backgrounds as all of the other people on that team, again, you would know that that team is not diverse. And in the geo, geospatial sector in our industry, our data, our tools, our techniques touch so many different policy areas. They impact so many aspects of human life, so many of the issues that we face as societies collectively and, and distinctly. So we need to make sure that our teams really reflect, reflect that rich human tapestry we need to make sure that people from all backgrounds are on our, on our teams. We need to make sure that black people are on our teams, that other people of color are on our teams, people from indigenous communities, people living with disabilities, and women of all backgrounds are on our team. And while we've seen some progress in terms of diversity in the geospatial field, we still have a lot of road to cover. And we, we have a lot of road to cover in the leadership space in particular. And given how important it is to tap into diverse per perspectives that just come from living different lives in, in our society, we need to make sure that we, our goal is an industry that completely reflects the breadth of, of our societies and that every geospatial organization is led by a team of people who reflect those rich voices, those, those rich perspectives, and those rich identities because those organizations are going to come up with more complete solutions, more impactful and effective solutions, and those organizations just outperform others financially as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Clinton. Uh, and I do agree with you that uh, the leadership of, <clears throat> our, our, of our organizations should reflect the, 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 the society that we, we, we live in. L let me go with the second question, and uh, this time I'm going to ask o Olivia. So what are the key benefits and advantages of having diverse leadership teams in the geospatial industry? So um, there's plenty of research out there and resource online. So I'm not going to teach uh, anyone, you know, why we need a leadership team. But if we wanted to some examples, I've just picked up a few. And, you know, one is by having a, a, a diverse leadership team, you obviously bring a, a more diverse workforce to start with. Uh, you get better staffing engagement, probably more, in, you know, because you feel more inclusive. Uh, you gain respect and trust from your employees. Uh, and also, I'm, obviously I work for the government, so I'm not, a, a private, I, I'm not from a private company, but there's plenty of evidence that shows that uh, diversity-led companies do better. So profit, revenue, investment, creativity, there's uh, plenty of studies on that. Um, but for me, it's not really what are these tangible key benefits that we need to reiterate and, and repeat every time because effectively what we're trying to do here is convince who that this is the right thing to do. I think the, the reason is the right thing to do is actually obvious and logical. It's about uh, 
like Clinton said, is about having the company run by uh, a diverse group of people that have that with, um, big breadth of uh, experiences and perspective, ability to relate to their employees, to their prospective clients. So it's kind of logical. And I just wanted to have the participation of the audience, if possible. But please uh, raise your hand if you knew this already, deep down, that these things were important. And that's the problem, isn't it? Because what we've got here is a, is a audience that actually is already converted. So effectively, I think the, the painful truth on the key benefits of having a leadership team is, uh, is actually the, the real change will be, in terms of diverse workforce, et cetera, will be when it comes from the top. And, uh, and there's, a, there's been, a, I'm just going to quote a few stats because there was a study by Workable that looked at, uh, which this is the wider industry, obviously mm -hmm. not geospatial, but they said that if you look at the DEI strategy priorities, 65% of the companies surveyed uh, had a company-wide diversity as a objective. But when you looked at the leadership diversity only, it was only 25%. So what does that mean? Does that mean that basically people are happy to have a diverse workforce, but not really change the leadership because they're quite happy in their space? And I think for me, it's like, it's a hard question, but it's, you know, as leaders, whether we're whichever background we are, but especially if we're the majority background, uh, do we need to start thinking about stepping down or change and let the others do the job? Uh, this is a hard question, obviously, um, but uh, it's kind of going back to, it's, it's well and good to kind of demonstrate the advantage and the, and the benefits of having a, a, a diverse leadership team, but we need the leadership team to embrace it and do something about it. Okay, thank you, thank you, Olivia. Uh, Puja, the next question is for you. So how can organizations promote and support the development of diverse leaders? That's a great question. I mean, uh, I think the first, uh, if I were to summarize what organizations should do, it is to really walk the talk. It's all nice to talk about diversity, it's all nice to have panels about it, events about it, but in the end, the proof's in the pudding, right? And um, I, can, I can maybe give you some examples of what we as a company do as Fugro, um, and, and also some other best practices that I've heard from other companies that I think really make a difference. I think to start off with, you need to have active goals and an active strategy to, incre uh, to increase diversity within your organizations. It shouldn't be a chance thing. It, it shouldn't be, let's just wait for the right applicant to come by and then we, we hire the right people. There should be a strategy in place. How do you target these kind of applicants? How do you make job profiles interesting for a variety of different applicants? How do you nu nuance the, the wording in your job advertisements so that a range of different people apply? How do you encourage people with imposter syndrome to apply to these uh, positions, you know? So it, it, has to go, it, has to go, uh, it has to go deep. Um, uh, the other thing is to have that, that uh, culture within the company that, that enforces this sort of behavior. So at Fugro, we have uh, what we call the Fugro values, which are, which are four key pillars on which we base all of our decisions, business and otherwise. We are determined to deliver. And you can only deliver if you have a diverse workforce. Uh, we prepare for tomorrow. How do you prepare for tomorrow? With a diverse workforce. Um, we do what's right. Obviously, the right thing to do is to hire a wide range of people. Um, and we build trust. We build trust both within the company, amongst our employees, but also trust outside with our partners, with our clients, with all of our stakeholders. Um, something else that's, that's important is transparency. I think the culture must foster transparency. And I'm talking about uh, you know, programs such as making sure there's equal pay, making sure that there is a transparency. We, we, uh, you know, we do research internally to make sure that you know, uh, on, on the grand scheme of things, the men and women who do the same job are paid the same amount. Um, these kind of endeavors are, I think, very, very important to build that transparency within the system. Um, and then there's other things like maybe more intangible things like uh, flexible working arrangements, being, uh, being flexible enough to, to, to make sure that people, no matter what their cir circumstances are at home, um, whether they're, they're, they're caregivers at home or whatever, they all have a, a space in the workforce. They're all enabled. Uh, to circumvent their limitations, work whenever they, they, are, they are able to. 
And of course, I'm, I'm a technologist by background. I love technology, so I will have to throw that into the story. And we're obviously a technology company. Uh, we also invest in technologies that help us uh, reach these goals when it comes to uh, you know, diversity. A lot of our work in Fugro is offshore. That means people going out on boats and vessels away from their families for very long periods of time. What we've done is invest in technologies around remote operation centers. Uh, we call this our future workforce program. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking people away from these kind of environments where they have to be away from home, which by definition means that if you're a young mother, if you have a small baby at home, you cannot do these jobs, right? But this way, through, through our remote operation centers, we have the experts in the office behind a computer screen able to do exactly what they would have been able to do had they been offshore in that vessel. So having this, these technology enablers really helps in building that, that whole diversity story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pooja. Uh, one aspect of you know, trying to promote leadership, uh, diversity in the leadership, that has been always mentioned is, of course, mentorship and sponsorship. So Laura, I'm going to ask you a question on that. So what role do you think uh, mentorship and sponsorship programs can play in fostering leadership diversity in our organizations? I mean, I think, I think both mentorship and sponsorship are, are absolutely necessary. And I think it's part of those actionable steps that a company can, can implement. Um, I think a lot of times people seek out mentorships um, naturally, but I think that it's a good idea for companies to have more like formal written programs about mentorship um, and to encourage that to happen. And now mentorship is typically someone with um, influence, uh, guiding and supporting someone who might be newer to the industry, whereas sponsorship is more uh, deliberate. It's recognizing that... Um, you know, someone might be from a historically marginalized community um, and then recognizing that uh, someone else is in a position of power and then should use that power to help advance um, the career path for, for another person. And um, I mean, I think people think that it, it, it sounds like a huge undertaking to kind of develop sponsorship programs, but um, a sponsorship program can be, you know, some, something as simple as verbally advocating for someone um, but also really it's, I mean, I think you need to put a, put a budget line for sponsorship and it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be something as simple as, um, ensuring that someone every year goes to a conference like this. Um, so it could be, you know, paying, paying for that ticket, uh, paying for that travel, um, to ensure that, to, to ensure that those people, um, are, are seen and able to participate in, in the industry. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much, Laura. I, I'm going to be a little bit more concrete in, deep in, in the conversation. So when we think diversity, there are three elements that, comes to mind, that come to mind. Hiring, promoting, and retaining. And you can take them, I mean, retaining and promoting, you, you can take them in any order. So in order to have diverse leadership, you need to hire better. You need to promote better, and you need to find ways to retain the people that end up going to be promoted. So, Olivia, I'm going to go back to you and ask you, what step can be taken to ensure that hiring and promotion processes are fair and unbiased, and that they promote diversity in leadership positions? So, caveat here, I don't work for HR. <laughs> I'm not, don't take my advice for... But uh, again, there's lots of resource out there. But uh, working for the government, I think, is a, is a good example because we do have some robust systems to make sure that we, we do uh, inclusive hiring, is called. Um, so things like anonymized uh, applications, uh, making sure that the job description is not biased when, uh, when we post it out. Um, there's lots of things. So, I mean, you can, you can Google inclusive hiring. There's a lot of resource on there. Um, but what I didn't realize, uh, and researching a little bit before coming here, was uh, there's actually a NISO standard for HR management and diversity and inclusion. And I didn't know this. So there are some tools out there that people can use. And as even, I even found a company that uh, provides AI tool to remove the bias from, uh, <laughs> from job description. So there's lots of stuff out there. 
I'm going to become controversial again. I was like, there's so much stuff out there to the point that really there's no excuse anymore. Um, but to me, for me, there's three main points that we need to kind of implement, as well as all the different tools that exist. Um, because effectively, like you said, you, you recruit people, but it's not just about recruiting, it's about keeping mm. the diversity, right? So if your diversity, you know, we, we all have uh, targets like we have to have 15% uh, representation of ethnic minority in the, d the workforce. But that doesn't mean anything if your adverts are biased or if you're, you know, all these other things. So you need to kind of think about it as in a holistic way. And I think for me, the three takeaways are, it starts with being conscious that we need to improve. So it's that growth mindset. And as long as people in the organization have got that growth mindset, you can then start implementing those tools and, and make it work. Second th is what you said earlier, Albert, is about understanding the problem. So being curious, starting with understanding uh, from within what are the issues, focus group, looking at internal mobility, tracking, um, learning and iterating, basically. And then the third one, which is a bit of a plug, um, is to basically connect with the diversity network. Effectively, you need to get in touch with those, uh, lots of those uh, voluntary organizations that are doing that because it's their passion, because that's what they believe in. Um, you need to set partnerships and work with them, fund them, help them, because they will help you in return to kind of advertise in those hard to reach areas. And you need to make the most of that because there's so many that exist. I mean, I think all of us are part of one, pretty much. <laughs> so uh, yeah, look out for those. Thank you, thank you so much, Olivia. Uh, Clinton. How can organizations create inclusive leadership cultures that encourage diverse, diverse voices and perspectives? And, and we know how proud companies are with the culture, right? So how can we make sure that those cultures are actually uh, inclusive leadership cultures? Yeah. Um, I'm going to define maybe four terms this time. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's really important, again, to, like, to, to have shared understanding of these terms. I'm going to define inclusion. I'm going to define culture, I'm going to define climate, and I'm going to define equity. I'm going to take my time with all this stuff, but I'll start with mm -hmm. culture versus climate. So culture are your values. It's the things that at, at the highest levels you profess you will do as an organization. We believe in transparency, fairness, equity, inclusion. Those are the things that they say at the highest level. Now, climate is, is what it actually feels like on the ground, on your team in a meeting, are inclusive practices being used, right? And so when we, when we think about inclusion, just to define that really quick, it, if diversity was about sort of measuring the breadth of that human tapestry that exists on our teams, inclusion is about celebrating that diversity. And it's more than just acknowledging those, those differences, it's about embracing those differences. And it's not just differences in the disciplines that we have um, those are important. It's not just differences in the countries that we come from. Those are also important. But it's also about the differences in the wide range of ethnic and cultural and social backgrounds that we have. Um, and our social backgrounds, they lead to differences in our experiences and our perspectives. Which if we embrace those differences, not just the things that we have in common that bring us together, but those differences, then we're tapping, tapping into what I think is like the most important thing about humanity, difference. When we tap into those differences, we create more complete and, and comprehensive solutions. Now, getting back to what folks can do to create spaces that are, that are inclusive, I think there are three sets of things you can do. You can promote safety and belonging, and leaders should do that but it's also everyone's job. You can promote active listening and continuous learning. Again, leaders can do that, but it's everyone's job. You can take proactive and equitable actions. Um, and again, it's leaders, leaders' responsibility to do this, but it's everyone's job. And since I said equity and equitable, I'll define that really quick. So everyone has been talking about um, how this stuff is the right thing to do? Why is it the right thing to do? Why is it the right thing to do to invest more in underrepresented groups, more in marginalized communities? Well, it's because those communities have been 
marginalized. They're underrepresented because they've been underserved and pushed to the side. We all live in societies that have historically created barriers for some and benefits and opportunities for others. So we have to invest thoughtfully in ways that will level the playing field. And sometimes that leveling means investing more where needs are greater, providing sponsorship programming for those organizations, for those groups and those, those people who maybe are co coming from backgrounds where they have less resources. Um, so when we think about how we would promote safety and belonging, I'll say something really practical. If you're in a meeting and you want to share an idea, but you know that there's a person in that meeting who always gets upset when someone has something new to say or they have a difference of opinion, then you know that you're not in a space that's safe. You're not in a space that's promoting belonging. So everyone should be listening to everyone else in the room, making sure that everyone's voice is heard, every perspective is shared and understood, and really consider those voices that are coming almost out of nowhere. You know, that one person who disagrees with everyone else or sees it slightly differently. They may be having a difference of opinion that comes from a difference in their background that has positioned them in society differently so that they see the problem at another angle. They're probably giving you an additional viewpoint to the same challenge that you're dealing with. So make sure that people can feel comfortable being heard and encourage them to, to, to speak up. Listen actively and learn. Everyone should constantly be learning, but leaders in particular. Leaders should find time to read books, watch shows, not just TV, not just documentaries, but you know, TV shows that center the lived experiences of people who don't look like them, so you can understand other people's perspectives. Think about the challenges people are facing. Read the news about groups of people who are not like you, and bring that understanding into the workplace and take equitable actions, be proactive. So proactively mentor, find someone in your organization from an underrepresented group and mentor them. Find people from underrepresented groups in your organization and sponsor them, speak up for them, um, put their name forward, ask yourself why you're not putting their name forward when an opportunity presents itself. Um, during COVID-19 at my company, at, at Esri, when everyone was scrambling to address this disaster, and it happens with every disaster, we weren't always bringing, thinking about who's the best person to bring to the table to address these issues. We were thinking about the people who we usually bring to the table. And as a result, all across the country in the US, people were leaving race and ethnicity and gender and sex off of the maps, even though that data was always there and always available. But because in other spaces, in small spaces, small communities, or, or, or some big cities in case, in, in fact, like Milwaukee, there were black and brown women who found it important to just put race and ethnicity on the map alongside all the other data, and they saw the patterns. It was immediately obvious. And it would have been immediately obvious to all of us had different people been brought into those rooms, had different people been sat at the table and those different perspectives considered. So, Diversity and equity and inclusion, these things don't just make us feel comfortable at work, but in the work that we do, they save lives. Thank you, Thank you Clinton. Uh, so geospatial sector is not an isolated uh, sector, right? So Laura, I have a question for you on how can the geospatial industry collaborate with other sectors to learn from their experiences and best practices in promoting leadership diversity? Um, yeah, that, that's a great question and kind of not sure where to start with that because there's so many industries that are, that are doing good work. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that the, the construction industry has been, has been you know, making leaps and bounds with, um, with at least uh, trying, to, trying to advance um, you know, more gender equality. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that we can kind of start uh, collaborating with academic institutions. And um, I, I kind of think that that is the way to kind of build this pipeline of diversity by collaborating more with academic institutions. Um, I think it's great. I've seen so many universities here, but um, you know, I would like to see um, you know, kind of like a networking as like part of the curriculum for some of these, for some of these academic institutions if they could send people to events like this. Um, there's also a lot of other industries that have been doing things successfully. I mean, if you look at some of the giants from like financial institutions, like um, MasterCard, I think is 
is, you know, doing massive uh, financing of STEM programs. Um, Johnson & Johnson is about 50% uh, leadership of, of women in, in their leadership roles. And, um, and so there's a lot of these big giants that are doing stuff. And I think there's a lot of smaller companies too. But um, I think that it's, it's interesting to look at um, some of these big companies because they're investing massive millions and millions of dollars. And, um, and the reason why they're doing that, you know, because, because it's the right thing to do, sure, maybe, um, but also because it's, it's, it's impacting the bottom line. Um, and so they're, they recognize that by having more diverse leadership, they're making more money, so. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Laura. So once again, I really recommend you to, to look at that uh, report that we, we are putting out. And one thing that you're gonna notice is most of the ideas that we are hearing now here are actually captured in, in, in the report. And there is a part of the report that I, I like is all those use cases that you know, we have at the, the end of the report. And most of our organizations actually share some of the best practices when it comes to, to diversity in the leadership. And I'm not the first one to say everything is, is perfect because we all know it's not. So my last question to you, Puja, is actually how can we hold our organizations uh, accountable for making progress in leadership, diversity, and are there some metrics that can be used to measure that? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, asking a geodata specialist about metrics is, mm. is a dangerous one because you'll get a very long answer. Mm. Um, but I think, I think, I mean, the obvious metrics are looking at, you know, uh, demographics, right? Mm. Like, look at higher management, look at how many, how is it distributed? Those are the obvious ones. Um, I, think, I think what's also important is to always set a time frame along with these targets. So you're not saying, well, this is a, a, a loose target. This is really something that should be embedded within whatever system you're using to track targets, whether it's OKRs, whether it's KPIs, whatever you want to call it. But I think these, th there should be a time frame and there should be a solid goal. Um, and I think other, other metrics um, could, could be around, you know, pay equity kind of assessments. You can have uh, metrics around succession planning. Because again, I think what, what it was mentioned earlier, uh, a, an easy excuse to say is that, well, we don't have the applicants for this position, so we can't choose them. But if you put some thought into it and do an upfront succession planning, then you can, you can you know, plan depending on when these applications come in and you know, have that sort of a, as, as a real metric. Um, and I think that there, there should be constant feedback within the organization. So employee surveys is, is a good way to, to check the pulse of the company, um, make sure that uh, you know, environments you're in um, um, have the right level of diversity. And I think also ad hoc things, right? I've been in meetings where I've walked in and then it's been just a room full of men and I'm literally the only woman in there. And, and I think the more and more this happens, it should be raised to management. And you, you need to say, well, it's, it's all nice to say you're being diverse, but then, you know, where are the women in the room? Like, you know, make sure that the targets are, are sort of effective at all levels of the organization, uh, rather than, you know, uh, a bucket target for the entire company. Um, and I think other metrics that should be taken into account uh, in terms of, uh, and, and also accountability, is, uh, for instance, exit interviews. When people leave the company, uh, it's, it's important to, to emphasize and really understand the reasons, the true motivations for people to leave. Um, and, and also uh, uh, continuously analyze retention rates when it comes to, uh, to employees. And then there are other metrics, of course, that you could think of uh, making sure that your, your, your work is, 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 uh, is recognized. So awards, like, like the one that we're going to be uh, shortly uh, announcing, I think. Um, so awards, uh, other kinds of external recognition, I think these are important uh, um, uh, metrics uh, for, for organizations. But also, I mean, we all audit our businesses all the time. We should have audits and reviews for, for, for diversity as a metric as well. And I think that could be quite an effective, uh, effective way. Um, so yeah, these are really some of the ideas that I can think of. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pooja. So I know that DEI is a, is a topic that makes people uncomfortable. And that's why when we have a panel like this, you, you, don't, want a lot of, you don't have a lot of people we will join because they are not coming here to be uncomfortable. But it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to 
to feel like I, I don't like what they're talking about. But let me listen a little bit. And you may not agree with what we believe in. We may not, you may not see some of our ideas uh, as being a priority for your organization. That's okay. All we want is for people to, to give a little bit of their time to hear what we have to say. We want people to, I always say, I want people to become advocate of DEI. But in order to be advocate of DEI, you have to understand the issue, and should I say the issues of DEI. It's not about pointing fingers at people. As you may have noticed, we didn't point fingers at anybody here. But we just said there is another way to look at how we operate as the geospatial community. And we can look better than the image that we give out. When you see a panel, when you go to a conference, when you go to a geospatial event, you should feel different whenever you notice that there is some kind of homogeneity in your audience, in your leadership, in the, your customer the, you, you, you're talking to, in your audi the audience that you're addressing. And you can be part of the solution. And being part of the solution is not cutting some people out. It's just trying to find ways to bring other people with us, to bring pe other people together. If that's one thing you can get out of a conversation like this, please let that be, we need to do more at the individual level, within your team, within your organization, and within the geospatial community as whole. That's why we're having this event. Hopefully next time we're gonna have a little bit more people. I think this year we have maybe a little bit more than what we had last year. <laughs> so I expect, you know, year after year, we're gonna have more people to join and we won't say that it's the bandwagon. It's just a, a, a long train. So as long as you want to join this train, we're going to add wagons to the train so that many of us are advocates of DEI. So that years from now, when you look at the geospatial community, the geospatial community looks like the world we live in. So thank you so much for attending. And I really want to thank my panel here for their thoughtful answers to the difficult questions that are prepared for them. So thank you so much. Thank you. So now I think I'm going to give the floor back to Kuwili. Thank you, Albert, and thank you for those, uh, you know, uh, these discussions are always so interesting. I never want them to end. But then it is important to take it to the next level. We were just talking about, you know, there is this uh, things that we should do. It's not only talks. Uh, so one of the things, one of the action items that we have, uh, we just started last year. So our Trailblazer Awards. And um, uh, uh, now we are going to proceed on to the Trailblazer Awards, uh, Albert. Should we leave? Uh, Albert, Should you can stay back. Uh, and, uh, so yeah. they can stay? Or yes, have... you must stay. You, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming back. And uh, I would like to invite uh, Barbara Ryan back again onto the stage for the awards, please. Clinton, you won last year, didn't you? Yeah. Congrats. Oh. Um, let's see, I think I said it at the beginning, but there are a few different people in the audience. Uh, we, WGIC, have been working with Intergeo uh, for, well, at least the last two years. Mm -hmm. And um, under, again, Alberts and the DEI uh, committee's leadership with support from Kuhaley, uh, not only after they put the committee together, but said, well, why don't we initiate a Trailblazer Award? So there are two awards. Uh, one to an individual who has exerted leadership in this particular area globally. And so, and nominations can come from anywhere. Doesn't have to be a member of the WGIC community, can be anywhere in the entire world, but in the geospatial sector. The second award g does in fact go to a membership uh, member of WGIC. So again, nominations can come from anywhere, 
but the winner has to be a WGIC member. So this is the second inaugural year of the Trailblazer Awards. I'll, I'll stop there, but no, well, go ahead, go okay, ahead. I'll go keep going, all yes, right? Going. Because I would mm -hmm. like to just say on behalf of WGIC, um, I want to say something about the last panel, sure. the, you know, the panel discussion mm -hmm. that you had, because I have to say, um, while this DEI committee came into place, um, that I think has actually uh, put some peer pressure on our member companies, because mm -hmm. when I first came into WGIC, there, were, there was no diversity at the patron level. Mm -hmm. There is now, a member company has come mm -hmm. forward and put some diversity at the highest level, and the diversity at our executive board level has, okay, the numbers were low, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. There were maybe two people on the executive board. There are now four people uh, on that executive board uh, that are diverse. Mm -hmm. And I think the forcing function there was the creation of the DEI committee that facilitated these discussions. Mm -hmm while as uncomfortable as they are, and Albert, you mentioned that, they're not mm -hmm. easy conversations to have. Mm -hmm. so, so thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, with that, are we yeah, announcing the, how are we doing this? You Kuhili? start with this one, the individual award. All right, you wanna go do ahead. it? No, you, please go ahead. All right, so for the, indi I wanna look back here, mm -hmm. for the individual award, Olivia Powell, you just saw her on the last panel. Olivia, come up. And as, yeah. thanks, kiddo. This is good. I have two things. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, let me get out of the way. Barbara, come to now the there are two You don't want to be on the picture? <laughs> sure, I can so, do that. So, you want the picture with Barbara? And she's going to say some few words, Barbara. She's going to um, say some few words. And there are just two stories here, and I'll look to Artie Ayers in the audience. Artie, we actually lost a shipment of awards that were coming in. And so, Artie wasn't sure the original Trailblazer Award was going to arrive, and so she actually had this made up also <laughs> in the last week. So you get two awards, mm -hmm. and it's kind of a nice mix of color mm -hmm. too. So Artie, thank you for uh, thank you for doing that. Olivia, uh, we'll hold the awards because I do think uh, you might want to take a minute or two more and just talk about that journey because I know not only have you worked in women and GIS largely mm -hmm. on the government side, but feel free to say a couple things about that, okay? Hi, and thank you so much for uh, giving me the award. I mean, I didn't expect it at all, so it's uh, really <laughs> nice. It's my first award as well. Um, <laughs> I never win. Um, yes, the reason I'm, uh, I've started working, I guess, or, or in being invested in diversity is because um, I'm my background is in geospatial, and we all know the geospatial. I've been in there for 20 years that, uh, you know, in the start, it wasn't that diverse. But also, I was working in the police service, which uh, meant that in IT and in the police, you can imagine that I was pretty much on my own all the time. And, um, and it wasn't to kind of be saying, you know, I've had enough, there's not enough women in here. It was like because I felt a bit lonely, and I just wanted to kind of reach out. And so when uh, some of my colleagues uh, started Women Plus in Geospatial, I joined in and I was fully in. Um, and then I became a director of it and uh, I pushed and I've been talking to everybody about it. I think that's probably why I'm, uh, I'm known for uh, being an advocate. But I guess um, for me it's not a hard thing to do, it's just the right thing to do. And I think my journey, although it started as being the only woman, I have noticed it's broadened my eyes and I've noticed the, the lack of diversity in general. And because I'm a bit of a sucker for fairness, I have to admit, I then push for the wider diversity. And, and now at work, I'm labeled the inclusion person again. But you know, I'm happy because it's kind of making a difference and, and helping others that wouldn't have that help. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so you, I hope you got some luggage over the weekend. Congratulations again. Yeah.
congratulations, Olivia. And actually, uh, also, um, Clinton was in the room and uh, uh, was the awardee last year. So thank you for joining us. Um, okay, the second and last award uh, goes to a member company of uh, WGIC. Unfortunately, they couldn't join us here, but I'm going to ask Erin to come up, incoming executive director for WGIC, and accept the award on their behalf. Um, and what's really interesting about this company, this is the award that goes to Ivona. I don't know if we have a slide. A video. A, um, a video. Uh, oh, oh, we do have a video. Yeah. All right. A video. No, Should you I show the it. video first? Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah, let's show it now, and then I'll come back and mm -hmm. make one last intervention. Yeah, yeah, sure. you can see. Yeah. Uh, while we're teeing up that video, let me just uh, say it. So this award that goes to a WGIC member company, uh, Albert chairs the panel, mm -hmm. and, but it's WGIC people that are on the award committee. And what I think is so interesting about this, Ivona just joined. They haven't been in the, they, this is their first year mm -hmm. in the institution and yet put a nomination package together that was, that just rose to the top mm -hmm. for the entire diversity committee to come in and say they deserve this award. Yeah, yeah. So, Ivona. We think. All right, you know me, I don't like silent space, so let me keep talking. Mm -hmm. The other thing about Ivona, and, and this kind of, while we often, we're oh, we're here. Well, you don't have the song. MD of Ivona to accept the WGIC's DEI Trailblazer Award for 2023. This recognition really underpins our commitment to making the space industry more inclusive, equitable and accessible for all and our work goes beyond just the work today hi everybody we're so sorry we can't be with you today but it's my absolute pleasure as the md of avona to accept the wgic's dei trailblazer award for 2023 this recognition really underpins our commitment to making the space industry more inclusive equitable and accessible for all and our work goes beyond just the workplace and that's embedded with the work that we do within our stem community and we really believe that if we can cultivate that at grassroots level then that will benefit the industry as a whole so thank you once again for this recognition thank you to everybody all of our team who work hard at avona but also all of our business partners and supporters Thank you so much. This really means so much to us at Avona. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. We're so sorry we can't be with you today, but um, it's my absolute uh, pleasure as the MD no video, of Avona. Yeah, we got audio. Uh, let me just finish the uh, comment about Avona. You know, we often talk about the geospatial sector not being, uh, it's, it's, it's not as big as agriculture or energy or mining. It's, it's a rather small sector. Um, of course, our new logo says geospatial is everywhere and for everyone. Uh, but when you look within that geospatial sector, there's just tremendous diversity. You have equipment manufacturers, you have satellite manufacturers, satellite operators, uh, you have software providers, you have service providers. You've heard from many of them over the last couple of days on our panels. Evona comes in as largely a staffing organization for the geospatial and or space sector. So they're just another part of this ecosystem. And while many of our companies, particularly the big companies, have their own HR departments, all of many of our associate members, startup companies, don't have that. And Evona works specifically on staffing for our sector. So a really unique part of the ecosystem. And um, maybe that had a lot to do with uh, them winning the award. Mm -hmm. I'll stop talking, Albert. I'm going to give you the last <laughs> word. 
Thank, thank you so much, Barbara. And with this, we end this session on DEI. And Aaron, you promised me that next year we're going to have another one. That should be your first decision as the new lead of WGSC. And once again, Barbara, you know what I think. Thank you for everything. And we hope to continue what you, you have started and to make sure that DEI is a priority for, the, for organizations. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.